I tell you, God is amazing. Thank you, church, again. You don't know what a difference this has made already just in, in this week when I'm just getting everything set up. Uh, but uh, it just is so much easier to work with. It is, God, it's, even the, the looks of it is better because it's high definition uh, and everything just is running. It couldn't be any better. So praise God. Now, before we get into the life of the Messiah, class number 12, um, we have a little correction from last time, something I realized when I was, actually, it was one of the things I woke up in the middle of the night and said, did I say that? I did. So here's, here, here we go. If I can get it to work. Herod the Great is not the one that beheaded John the Baptist. This was on my head in the middle of the night, and I think, wait a minute, Herod, Herod died years, just shortly after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't behead the baby. He killed babies, but not John the Baptist. It was Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, that killed uh, John the Baptist by beheading him. So there's my whoops. Uh, but anyway, okay. <clears throat> the arrival of the king, the advent of the king, now the annunciation of John's birth to Zacharias. Now, through here, sometimes they will refer to as Zacharias, sometimes as Zechariah. It's the same person, the same way, just two different ways of pronouncing it. So in Luke, uh, Luke chapter uh, one, in verse five, if you have your uh, harmony or your scriptures, if you would, uh, it says, in the days of Herod, as Herod the Great, uh, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So it says that uh, uh, he was a priest of the division of Abijah. Well, what on earth is that? It goes all the way back to King David. Um, once Luke gave the basic introduction to his gospel, which we have covered, he then begins to talk about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it happened. But we know that uh, John the Baptist, his announcement and of his birth uh, came first. And it tells us how that came about with the special angelic announcement to, um, let me uh, do something here real quick. And there we go. I almost forgot about putting the speaker view on there. Um, he was a common priest. Uh, he wasn't a high priest. He wasn't a chief priest. He was just a common priest. Uh, as a matter of fact, we said he came from the hill country. Uh, many people around Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city five people, considered to be basically a hillbilly, or anybody that lived in that area would have been. Um, in, in 1 Chronicles 24, 1 Chronicles 24, the first 19 verses, 1 Chronicles 24, the first 19 verses, you can read about King David. We're not going to take time to read it today. Uh, where King David uh, divided the priests, the Levitical priests, into uh, 24 uh, courses, they were called, or 24 uh, divisions uh, by which these people would serve according to that particular division uh, within the priestly temple. There were so many Levites doing so many things that David was the great organizer, and he organized the Levitical priesthood. Uh, there was one high priest, that was the one assigned uh, by the Lord, one high priest, but underneath each high priest was, was 24 chief priests. Each one of the chief priests uh, were in charge of the common priest. Now, um, it tells us that Zacharias was one of those 24 courses, and he was of the course of Abijah, that each one of the courses had different names. We don't need to go through them. You can see 
though the historical activity of what brought this about from there in First Chronicles 24. But now the priests had many activities. Um, they would function as officials of the government. Uh, they would be judges uh, so that they were serving both a, a religious and a civil function. Remember, Israel was a theocracy, theocracy. In other words, it is a government run by God. Now, uh, God, there was a direct theocracy um, uh, up until the time of Samuel. Then it became, uh, the people insisted on having a king, and so there was Saul, after Saul came David, but it was, David was still subservient to, um, to God, and so God is the one who had organized uh, the way that Israel was to be run. There was no separation of church and state, if you will. We would put it in our terms here in America. No separation of the religious from the governmental functions. So they were officials. You can see that in First Chronicles 23, uh, verse 4. They also were assistants uh, within the temple, the temple districts, uh, whatever needed to be done. That's in First Chronicles 23, 28. Then they were also function as religious leaders. The, Levi the Levites had a great choir. They didn't just have a little praise team like we do. Uh, they had hundreds of, of priests who were the singers and they would play the instruments and they would do all of those other things. They also were doorkeepers and guards. Uh, First Chronicles 26, the worship leaders of First Chronicles 25 verse six. What is amazing in all of that is all of these people were full time. That's what they did. That's how they made their live their livelihood. They were supported by basically not only the gifts and the offerings that came from God's people, but by what were essentially taxes. Much of the tithing was a tax uh, that the people paid, and through it, everything was supported. Uh, the 24 courses served in rotations, doing the daily functions, the daily rituals that had to be done in the temple. Um, basically, for one week, twice a year. One week, twice a year. Now, that's when the course would serve. But since it is by the first century, the number of priests was estimated to be about 18,000 of them. Uh, it was very possible that a, a common priest might serve doing what Zacharias, Zachariah is getting ready to, we're going to see what he did, maybe only once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, um, because there were just so many of them. And the, the course of Elijah came up, and how they decided who was of the course of Elijah to do it, uh, they would then cast lots. The casting of lots. You see that in verse 9, Luke chapter 1, and in verse 9, it says, according to the, that Zacharias, the, the, well, in verse 8, now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God, on the appointed order of his division, that's his division of Abijah, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Uh, we don't really know for sure exactly how the lot casting was done. Um, one person wrote and said the practice of casting lots is mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament. Now, uh, the one time it was used in the New Testament dealing with the selection of the replacement for Judas was, in my estimation, uh, and of many others, but in my estimation, was improper uh, because Paul was the 12th apostle and not Matthias. But be that as it may, the practice of casting lots seven times in the New Testament, in spite of the many references to casting lots in the Old Testament, Nothing is known about the actual lots themselves. They could have been sticks of various lengths, flat stones like coins or some kind of dice, but their exact nature is unknown. The closest thing 
to it today would be flipping a coin. Um, but they, this was one idea uh, that these that, uh, that did these pictures uh, had and may have been done, casting different colored stones with, with uh, or perhaps even something with their name on it. Uh, and from that, then it would be selected. And of course, Zacharias is chosen. Now, the thing to remember in all of this is none of this is by accident. Uh, the Lord had, had has instituted various ways for knowing his will in the Old Testament. There, there was the Urim and the Thummim. There, the, there was the breastplate. There were all these different things um, that the Lord used at the time. Um, casting lots was one of the accepted ways of doing things. And so remember, this is under the Old Testament economy. The New Testament, the new church age doesn't begin until Acts 2. So all four of the Gospels, even though they have a lot of information pertaining to the church and other things, Jesus lived his life under the Mosaic law. And so all of the things you see happening was still under the Mosaic law. Now, it says that they, Zacharias and Elizabeth in verse 6, um, it says that they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Uh, they were part of the Jewish remnant of the time frame. Now, it's important to have a clear understanding of what the remnant is. Um, the Jewish remnant refers to Jews who were also believers having received the gift of eternal life. The Mosaic law was never a means for attaining eternal life. It was always been by faith through grace. The practice of the Mosaic law within the nation was twofold. One, it was for a nation under a theocracy to be able to stay in fellowship with God. Now, all of the people coming out of, the New Testament tells us, the people coming out of Egypt were believers. But gradually, of course, uh, there were people who were, who were born and they, were, they would have to come to faith uh, to receive eternal life. Uh, the Old Testament times, as well as New Testament times, it's always by grace through faith. The second thing for the Mosaic Law was how an individual could stay in fellowship with God. Praise the Lord, we have 1 John 1, 9, and we're not under Mosaic law. Otherwise, we would be busy in here much of the time killing lambs and doves and, and cows and all kinds of things, which might be, you know, the, uh, the people that clean the church might not appreciate that very much. You probably wouldn't either. But anyhow, uh, Scott would say, hey, I could go in there and kill my deer there. So no. anyhow, but listen, listen. Prior to the coming of Messiah Jesus, they would have to believe the promise of his coming. That first promise goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Now, people have objected in saying, well, it was never made clear in the Old Testament how they had eternal life. But then again, there were many things in the Old Testament that were passed on verbally that are not written down. Uh, the people obviously understood uh, how they had eternal life. It's always by grace through faith. Uh, specifically, they knew that when they believed God's promise, uh, that they would then be resurrected to be with God in the kingdom. Let me give you some references you might want to jot down and see for yourself. For example, Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6. I'm going to show you in a minute, Job 19, 25 to 27. Job 19, 25 to 27. I'll repeat these one more time. And Daniel 12, 2 and 3. Daniel 12, 2 and 3. Those verses again, Genesis 15, 6. Job 19, 25 to 27. Daniel 12, 2 and 3. Now, it is logical and demonstrable, as I'll show you in a second, that when they believed in him for that eternal life, they knew what their destiny was going to be. 
For example, Job 19. Here is what Job says. Job is, other than the early chapters of Genesis, is one of the very earliest books in the Bible. Uh, Job was probably a contemporary of a younger Abraham. But be that as it may, uh, Job was probably the most advanced believer on the time frame. You know that Satan is the one that wanted to go after him and God allowed it, all of those other things. But look what he says in Job 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Redeemer, what is the Redeemer? The Redeemer is the one that redeems you out of the slave market of sin and places you into the family of God. Now, how much everybody understood all of those details that we now understand, I don't know, but he knew that his Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. Well, now you can trace that right back to Genesis 3.15 if you want to. Uh, there's a lot of doctrine that he understood right there. But let's go on. And after my skin is destroyed, you see, he knew that he, he was not his body. He simply lived in it. And after his skin is destroyed, when's that? Well, when you're buried, you become worm food. <laughs> yeah. This, look what he says. This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Wait a minute. After my skin is destroyed, that in my flesh I shall see God. How is that possible? A new body. A resurrected body. I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. Now, that you want to talk about something that'll preach. There it is. You could take that apart and you could get all kinds of doctrine out of there. This is what Job understood. Job, one of the earliest in the Bible and others. Where do they get all of this? From understanding God's word, but also there was a lot of direct revelation going on in the Old Testament times. So you can certainly see that people like uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they understood. That's why they were part of the remnant. Remember when Christ came, there were many born again people that had eternal life that were around him. Then there was a whole lot that were not. Those that were already believers, when they came to accept, you know, is, is I, as I said, came to accept Jesus as Messiah, they already had eternal life. They now had greater insight as to how that eternal life was guaranteed to them. But then there were many unbelieving Jews. We see them on the day of Pentecost, unbelieving Jews that came to faith when they now heard the clear message of Messiah Jesus, his promise of eternal life. So if we keep it clear in our head, we'll understand what the remnant is. The remnant are those who had believed they had eternal life. The remnant today of the Jews are those who have believed in Messiah Jesus for his promise of eternal life. Just because they claim Christianity, they claim uh, that they are Messianic Jews, doesn't make them the remnant. Unfortunately, unfortunately, much of, of hardcore Calvinism and Pentecostalism has penetrated into the Messianic Jewish movement with the result that they don't have eternal security, with the result that they believe a lot of bad doctrine. That doesn't make them the remnant. The remnant are those who have believed today in Messiah Jesus for his promise of eternal life, just like everyone else. Okay, it tells us in verse six that they were righteous. Now, remember the difference between imputed righteousness and practical righteousness. <clears throat> the righteousness mentioned here is, it says, if you look at it, let's read it again. It says that they were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. They were already part of the remnant. They certainly had imputed righteousness. The righteousness that was granted to them even before the death of Messiah Jesus. Before the death of Messiah Jesus, people were redeemed, they were given eternal life, and they were imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ 
before he died. But they were not allowed to go into, once they died, they went to paradise. Paradise was also called Abraham's bosom. And paradise, paradise was located either in the center of the earth itself or in the other dimension within the center of the earth, which I think is more likely. And uh, between paradise and torments or Hades was a great gulf. You can go to Luke 16 and read about it. So this righteousness that is here, they yes, they had the imputed righteousness, but this is the practical righteousness of day-to-day -day living. And they were faithful to God and their lives over many years. But it also says they were blameless. That doesn't make them sinless. How many of you in here have already practiced 1 John 1, 9 this morning? Don't raise your hand. How many of you need to practice 1 John? No, don't raise your hand. Listen, let me just make it simple. With the practice of open and honest practice of 1 John 1, 9, you now become blameless because it's confessed, it's settled. This is the relationship of a believer to the Lord. That relationship of fellowship. It meant that when they did sin under the Mosaic law, what did they have to do? They had to do the sacrifices. See what it says? It says, and they, they all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Well, what were those commandments and requirements? The Mosaic law. So they lived open and honest before God. Uh, inwardly, they had been born again. They were regenerate. They were part of the remnant. But beyond that, they were, listen to me, they were showing serious discipleship. You wonder why people are selected for special things within the plan of God? There it is right there. You not only have to be born again, you have to be serious about discipleship. Can I just insert here that what we're talking about in the second class leading up to the idea of rewards and rulership, glorification and so forth also depends upon serious discipleship. You don't know. Let me tell you something. Zacharias and Elizabeth had lived long. They were above 60 anyhow. And it says they had no child. Next verse. We'll be looking at that. Uh, they had no child. Um, that, was, that was something that of the time frame was a disgrace. In today's world, we celebrate it. God doesn't celebrate that. They, that Jewish uh, didn't celebrate that either. Um, they did not know that when they thought that their time of being able to have kids was over, that now they were going to have kids all of a sudden. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm in my 60s, almost 70. Uh, and, you know, I personally, I would not be excited about suddenly <laughs> realizing we got to raise another one. Uh, man, it's been hard enough raising, raising these, especially, you know, certain ones around here sitting over this direction. But anyhow. <laughs> Remember, walking blameless did not prove that they had eternal life. It proved they were disciples. Now, God may choose for his own purposes sometimes as to why someone doesn't, doesn't get pregnant. It may be for a lifetime. It may be it comes later than what you think it is. You know, so don't make any assumptions from this. But of the culture of the time frame, a lot of people uh, would consider that to have been a tragedy. Now, if you read Luke 1, verses 8 through 10, let's look at it together. Got your Bibles now? Okay, now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed time, uh, in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord of Ornations. There's the sovereignty of God. The Lord is the one using the methodology that was allowed at the time frame that made sure that it was Zacharias that got chosen. You know what I learned from that? Even in the little things, like perhaps a little rock, God can accomplish his purposes in your life. Don't think he doesn't see the little things. 
Pray about it. Seek him. Be faithful. You don't know what God's going to do. You know, Zacharias, when he went to work that day, was excited about he was going to be in the priesthood, perhaps or to the, the special service, perhaps the first or last time in his life. He didn't know what God had waiting on him. But anyhow, look what it says. Uh, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And verse uh, uh, 10, the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Now, these were a husband and wife that we know. One, they're in the temple area. They're, they're, the special thing is announced to them because they're at the temple area. Elizabeth would have been there supporting her husband. It doesn't say that, but you can assume that to be true because of what you see about them. She was as active in service of the Lord and discipleship as her husband was, just differently, but just as dedicated. Um, she was part of that multitude of the people uh, who were outside and were praying. Let me tell you this, how blessed is the man who has a wife that prays for him. I'm going to say it again, how blessed is the man who has a wife that prays for him. There's no greater service you ladies can do for your husband than to pray for them. Um, and that is not to pray for them that God would split their head with a lightning bolt down to their tonsils, uh, but <laughs> to pray for them that they'll be the man that God would have them to be. Especially true as her man serves the Lord in whatever capacity that is. That's why it's so important. And, and when you make a decision, for example, that when you have an opportunity to go earn some money, and instead, you, you determine that you need to be in Bible class. That's a godly decision. And that's a man who is serving the Lord. How blessed is the family who has a praying mother. Here's a quick takeaway. God will approve and bless any family who lives in practical righteousness. That's what they've been doing. Practical righteousness of discipleship. God will approve and bless any family who practices 1 John 1, 9 when needed. Same way he'll bless the family that worships the Lord, including both in the home and for today being a Bible teaching church together. A family that prays together. And a family that leads others to worship and pray and learn the word of God. He'll bless any family. I'll repeat that. Some of you are writing them down. Bless God will bless and approve of any family that lives in practical righteousness, practices 1 John 1, 9, worships the Lord in the home and in the church, prays together, and leads others to worship, pray, and learn the word of God. Worship, pray, and learn the word of God. Got those? So, the job, the job that Zacharias had was to was uh, in the temple was a fairly simple job. <laughs> you know what I love about that? It was as a mundane sort of thing as you could possibly get. It was important. You were going into the presence of the Lord. You're not going past the veil. You're right in front of the veil. And it's a very special thing, but it's not a big thing. You know, it's not like the high priest on the day of atonement. They're doing all of these things that has to go. This is just a common service. There's a lot of common service in the church. People that just clean the floors or fix the walls or play the piano or sing or, or whatever it is. I mean, do the books and the list goes on. Make sure the vans get run. Don't think that's not important to the Lord. Every piece is important. Every piece. You're as important to the Lord as Zacharias was. And his plan for you is just as important as it was for Zacharias. Priestly, this priestly duty would have been performed twice a day. So what he would do was there you can see the altar of incense, the big altar out here in the center. He had to go into the incense altar right in front of the veil, which was there was the Holy of Holies. So he would simply gather the coals from the altar of the burnt offering and go out there. Um, 
The procedure was to take those hot coals from the brazen altar, or altar, or also called the altar of sacrifice, outside the temple building. Take those coals into the holy place to the altar of incense in front of the veil and place the coals in the incense burner and then place the sweet smelling incense on top of it so that the aroma would fill the temple and it would also, that uh, sweet smelling offering would go across and through the veil into the Holy of Holies. It was a special incense. It was burned perpetually um, before the Lord upon that golden altar. You can see that in Exodus 30, verse 8. That's why it's called the perpetual offering. This is the perpetual offering that you read. Um, sunrise and dusk. So it's very early in the morning when this is happening. Sunrise. People got up mighty early to go to church back then. <laughs> it's not church, but you know what I'm saying? This was daily. This was seven days a week. And the people would come in droves to be there for this and pray, worship the Lord, go about their duties of the day, come back in the evening, in church twice a day, seven days a week. I like that. I don't think we can get that going around here, but. So here's what happened. He went into the incense altar. Now, uh, just if you've got your Bibles, go back to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, I'm not going to get where I wanted to get today. Surprise, surprise. First three verses of Leviticus 10. And we'll get through this next little piece here. This tells you what happened when they didn't, somebody didn't do the offering correctly. Apparently did not pull the coals off of the brazen altar or they used the wrong kind of incense that God had said. Whatever it was, here it is. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans. That was, by the way, that's what Zacharias would have done. You don't take the hot coals in your hands and go walking in. Um, in a fire pan. And after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, offering strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. In other words, they were doing it their way, not God's way. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the people spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. Now, Nadab and Abihu uh, had burned a the wrong kind of incense or, or the wrong kind of fire and God struck them dead. Now in Zechariah's day, the rabbis uh, said that if anyone burned the incense improperly, uh, that they would also be struck dead. So as common as this was, there was also an aspect to it of you better do this right. I feel that way many times when I come up here to preach, I better do this right. You know, I, I, my dad always used to say, I hope I die of a heart attack, preach my last sermon and die of a heart attack right there at the pulpit. My mother said, don't do that. <laughs> and he would always say, I know what she's going to do. She's going to be start over there playing. I'm so glad you're gone. You lousy sucker, you. But anyhow, <laughs> and then she would get mad at him and off, off they would, they were just having fun together. But uh, the Jews at the time believed that when the death angel showed up, he would stand on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, that's critical. That's what they were being taught. So the honor of being a priest would enter into the holy place, present to God this intercession. It's a, it represents prayers, by the way. The incense is typical of prayers. You see that in the book of Revelation. It was already great. But now God's going to speak to him through an angel. The, the, the climax of his whole career at the moment it happened, however, he did not see it that way. Matter of fact, it terrified him. Now you know why. So we'll come back next time and we will see what happened when he saw Gabriel. We'll come back next time. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be able to just gather around your word, to learn these things, to have our minds refreshed, 
uh, so that we can see clearly what you're doing in your scripture, Father. I thank you for these people here and those gathered on Zoom that have a deep desire to want to see and to learn. And they're not after just some, some uh, lightweight, motivational message, but they want to know what your word says, Father, just as you've commanded us. So I thank you for them. Pray that you'll bless each and every one. Give us clarity of thought and understanding. And thank you again for this time together. Uh, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll have a 15 minute break and then we will be back. Thank you. 